Viewers and subscribers, welcome back to Beating the Press Podcast. I am your host, Rafa. Now, coming up in today's podcast, we are going to be reviewing the two big games which took place over the weekend. Aston Villa versus Brentford, that one ending 3-3. And the big clash on Sunday, Manchester United versus Liverpool. That one blowing the title race wide open, that game ending in a 2-2 draw. Now joining me today to review these two matches and to talk some EPL football, we have returning to the podcast, Christoph. Good to be back, viewers. Yes, indeed, Christoph. Another weekend of some exciting football action and our attention pretty much turned to the two big games. Let's start by first looking back at Aston Villa versus Brentford, Christoph. That one ending 3-3. Um, it was honestly, you know, quite the interesting game. A lot of goals there. Uh, I don't know if it was down to the injuries and suspension or if it was down to game plan. I'm not sure, to be honest. But Aston Villa going um two up early, only for Brentford to claw it back and make it 3-2. Then for Aston Villa to get a, a late equalizer, very, very tantalizing game for the neutrals ah indeed yes and one would have expected and anticipated that aston villa would have bounced back with the champions league position looming but again another disappointing result i would say from an aston villa perspective spurs have now surpassed them and i believe spurs is the team now sitting in fourth Aston Villa sitting in fifth and it seems as if that champions league spot christoph is slipping slowly away from this Aston Villa team. I mean, their destiny right now is no longer in their own hands. And, you know, lots of games coming up. They still have the big, uh, they, you know, their next match is against Arsenal. And, of course, Arsenal will be looking to cement their place atop the EPL. But... Another disappointing output, I would say, from the Aston Villa team in terms of the result. Uh, scoring three, but at the same time, conceding three. And to me, that has been one of the big issues for Aston Villa throughout the course of this season. The goals come, but then their defense cannot really be relied on. I mean, plagued with injuries, but this is the EPL. This is English Premier League football. Every club is dealing with some sort of injury or another. And, you know, defensively, very questionable from Aston Villa, I must say. But credit to Brentford, Christoph. I mean, they've had a very up-and-down season, but we know what to expect from Brentford. On any given day, they can really show up at the party and really beat any of the big teams. They are one of those teams that can pull out some surprise results. And I would say this is another example of that determination, that fight, and that spirit that comes along with this Thomas Frank team. And, you know, 3-3, three, three, they too may have felt disappointed having gone ahead in the game. But, I, I mean, looking back now, you could possibly say 3-3 three, three was a fair result. Um... Yeah, three three is a fair result. And to what you're saying that Spurs is now in fourth and um I guess you know Aston Villa's fate is not in their hands. And it's not going to get any easier at the moment, given that they will face they'll face Arsenal, they'll face Chelsea. They'll face Chelsea. And they do <laughs> they will face um Liverpool. So it's it's very difficult. But there is a chance because Spurs will also have to face Arsenal. Man City and Liverpool and all these games are back to back. So um there is the potential for them to drop points in those games and for Aston Villa to potentially creep back in and claim that top four spot. Um so it's not all hope is gone. We 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 expect Spurs to potentially drop points around this time of the season. And um I did say I, I thought Aston Villa would be running out of steam around this period as well and we have been seeing them you know not getting the results that you would expect based on their you know first half of the season performances and even you know the first half of the second half of the season you're expecting better results from them um i was actually quite shocked at the beating that they got from man city i thought they would have put up more of a fight 
you know, they did in the first half, but, you know, they seemed to capitulate under the pressure during the second half. So, you know, quite telling, potentially it was the tactical changes that Pep had made, um, dropping both De Bruyne and Highland, possibly for to rest for upcoming games as well as to, you know, make his attack not as predictable as it was, you know, say against Arsenal and, you know, a number of other teams, you know, including Chelsea, where we've seen these teams have 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 gotten points off of Man City. Ah, indeed, definitely. Uh some interesting points there for sure. Uh it would have freshened up that Man City team and of course looming games in the Champions League versus Real Madrid as well. Uh, you know, as you said, top players being rested, you know, possibly to prevent injuries, get a little rest, but at the same time, still grind out the result. And Kevin De Bruyne and Haaland were back in action over the weekend versus Crystal Palace. And it was another win for Man City, keeping pace with the top boys, so to speak. And, you know, but it was in the Liverpool game, Christoph. Liverpool facing off with Manchester United. And again, this result would have put Arsenal, you could say, in pole position. You know, uh, Arsenal's destiny is back in their own hands on the back of this 2-2 2-2 defeat. I call it a defeat because that's what it felt like. <laughs> you know, uh, um, Liverpool got the opportunities to put away this Manchester United team, but again failing to convert in front of goal. So I pretty much call it a 2-2 defeat and this could spell the potential end of the Liverpool run. You know, when you look back at results, this would have been one of those standout fixtures, one of those standout results that you think you should get the three points, but Coming away, grateful for one, having gone ahead, were behind the eight ball, losing 2-1. And if not for a fairly late goal, you know, it could have been worse. But getting a point tied on points with Arsenal. But of course, Arsenal has a superior goal difference. And in my opinion, I thought they were out of the title race, but they are right back in it. You know, it's going to be interesting to see over the next coming weeks if they can balance both the Champions League and remaining top of the table as the games come tick and fast. So the pressure is now on Arsenal. They are the league leaders, you know. So we'll see how they fear at the top of the table. Liverpool could not stay there too long, you know, bowing to the pressure at the first big test, I would say. This was the first game on the Liverpool calendar that was a bit questionable. They... You know, even though they were favorite, this is a derby game and versus Manchester United, you know, those results are a bit unpredictable. And this was the first, you know, big test which they fail. And if you look at Liverpool record over the course, they have picked up little, very little points of the top six in the league, Christoph. That is a statistic which is very telling. You know, they do well against the lesser teams. But when they come up against teams in and around their position, they fail to really maximize on taking points uh, off them. But interestingly, Liverpool themselves have only uh, suffered defeat twice this season. Once at the hands of Arsenal and then once at the hands of Spurs in that dubious game with some very high-profile refereeing decision. Uh, (laughs) You know, I'm still talking about that one, but... Liverpool has only suffered defeat twice, but it is the draws which is now catching up to them, you know, dropping those points and failing to turn one point into three. And again, it was another disappointing result for the Liverpool faithful, a game which I thought they created enough to win. They end up dropping two points versus this Manchester United outfit. But Christopher, I'll bring you in at this point. I mean, how did you see that game? I mean, what are your thoughts? As as I had said before, I do, I did not think Liverpool was coming away with three points. Not because I think Manu is in some rich vein of form or something like that. Because of all the top teams, the only team that Manu seems to capitulate against is Man City, regardless of how good the other teams are playing. So I was expecting a fight. I think Liverpool were exceptionally lucky to come away with anything. Because <laughs> I thought Manchester United 
should have won that game after scoring that second goal. Had it not been for, you know, what I would say is an extremely soft penalty. Very soft penalty. Um, you know, no. I, I thought I, I thought <laughs> I'm United, not sure. I've seen softer, I mean, that that, that I, penalty I'm not say, versus no. Yeah, we've seen softer uh, penalties, but this was a soft penalty. This this yeah, I, mean, that... it, I think the Chelsea penalty versus this same Manchester United outfit was a softer penalty that one yeah, with Anthony penalty. involved. You know, I mean, subsequent replay saw that contact was made with the trailing leg. And that's where, you know, once you go to ground, then you're pretty much putting that decision in the hands of the referee. So, mistake there by, I would say, Bissaka going to ground. But uh, duly put away by Salah. And as you said, you know, it could have been worse for Liverpool. I saw where Liverpool became frantic in that game. And I thought, the pressure was telling, you know, the pressure at the top of the league, knowing that a poor result could be the end of your fight for a title. I saw where that pressure told on this there was a, team midway after, through the second half. After Man United got that second goal, I saw where Liverpool looked panicked for the following 15 to 30 definitely, minutes. Definitely, definitely. I saw that as well. I definitely saw that, you know, they look uncharacteristically out of sorts. But, and even the I coach, mean, you know, the, the you know, Klopp looked frantic on the sidelines and that emotion translated on the field and you could see, and that to me is a telltale sign, in my opinion, that this Liverpool team is not ready to win an EPL title. You know, when it comes to these high-pressure situations, you have to remain calm under pressure. And definitely, I did not see that from this Liverpool team. So, for me, that's a characteristic that this team is out of the race, in my opinion. It's now down between Man City and Arsenal, as far as I can see it. You don't so, think Liverpool has it? I No, I don't think Liverpool will make it. The, the panic I saw is a telltale sign that something is missing from this winning formula for Liverpool. You know, the fact that they got this Manchester United to beat, not only on one occasion, but now twice. And they pretty much made the same mistakes. I mean, what more can you do? It, it, it's a similar game plan that Manchester United came with, you know, in the FA Cup and in this game again. And similar to Liverpool, similar game plan also. A few personnel change, but in terms of the tactical approach, it was quite similar. The game pretty much went according to how it was scripted. And it was just a matter of Liverpool taking their chances which they failed to do, similar to that game in the FA Cup. That was the disappointing thing. They totally dominated, especially the first half. Shots and goal, shots on target, but failing, only managing one goal. If they had gotten a second goal, then this game would have been done and dusted. But once you're only leading by a goal, it only took a moment of madness, which was the case. You know, a, back, a poor back pass from the young defender picked off by Bruno and he started it from close to the half line and that from that goal went in the momentum shift and it was all Manchester United they got grabbed a second and as you say if not for some poor defending and poor finishing on the part of United because United did get a few other opportunities on the break you know it could have been worse and as you said panic set into this Liverpool team you could see the cracks opening as the pressure told when you know you should have put this team away and know you're fighting for your life uh several substitutions you could say panic subs in my opinion were made by Klopp so it doesn't look well for Liverpool for that game and in my opinion moving forward you know more of the same defensively poor conceding as I had suspected and it's really the offense which is keeping Liverpool out of jail right now. You can't keep going behind and expect to be bailed out time after time after time. You know, at some point in time, this is going to catch up on you. They managed to escape with a point versus Manchester United. It's not the end of the world. But looking ahead, looking forward, for me, looking on as a Liverpool fan... I don't feel that confident that this team will go on to lift the title. So, for me, the race right now is a bit down to Arsenal and 
Man City and Arsenal is right now in pole position as far as I'm concerned. A superior goal difference over the trailing two teams tied on point with Liverpool. So advantage Arsenal, I would say. What says you? I mean, I did say last week that I was expecting Arsenal to be back at the top of the table by the end of the weekend, and so it has been. Um, right now, I think Ar- Arsenal are looking very, very good. It is indeed in their hands. They have to maximize their points um, going into these final six fixtures. The The question is, do they have the squad depth right now, especially with the Champions League? Um Will they, you know, will they spread and try to, you know, maybe get to the end of both? You know, definitely the Premier League is definitely a priority for Arsenal. Winning after coming so close last season and no, we didn't grasp again. Um, Arsenal has been looking imperious since the start of the year, conceding only four goals in the EPL. And, you know, it looks set to continue at the moment. They just need to keep focus. But um, we can see where Man City seems to have woken up. So if they potentially get to the top, I don't think they'll be relinquishing it. So, well, I think Manchester City has woken up a bit too late, to be honest. I mean, uh, all it takes really is one game. But right. the only thing I can right now see stopping Arsenal is a serious injury to a key player. Maybe one of those central defenders, you know, much like what happened last year when Saliba went down with an injury. You know, the backup was looking, but Arsenal has so much momentum currently that possibly even a major injury, you know, there's enough squad depth to bring them across the finish line. But as I said, all it will take is one game. So every game from here on in is really a cup final and Nothing other than a win will, you know, sir, sir. It, nothing other than a win is, is guaranteed in terms of you finishing at the top of the league. So each game is a cup final, and there may be further twist in the tail. But as it stands right now, I would say clear advantage Arsenal. And I mean, on the back of the performance they had versus Brighton as well. Ah, very clinical, very clinical indeed. And of course, as you mentioned, their defense has been superb. Haven't lost a game since the turn of the year in the EPL either. So they are unbeaten thus far. But that could potentially play in the hands of the other two teams. You know, law of averages may suggest that at some point in time, you will drop some points there or thereabouts. It's just a matter of whether the chasing team would potentially uh, make you pay for those drop points. But going forward, looking ahead, Christoph, what says you about this Arsenal team? Who do they have next? And will they continue their winning streak, so to speak? Bayern Munich. But I, I do feel Arsenal have more than enough this season to defeat Bayern Munich. A, a, a Bayern Munich that is... Clearly in turmoil and struggling in the Bundesliga. I think I think it should be a case where Arsenal defeat Bayern Munich and move on to the semi-finals. So no one is speaking about Arsenal doing the double? Could they potentially win the EPL as well as the Champions League? Um, I haven't I haven't heard of anyone making that proposition thus far. As far as I know, I'm the first to be mentioning that possibility. But no, what what are we saying? I, I you know, Arsenal is operating where, below the radar where the Champions League is concerned. Dark horses for the Champions League at the moment, possibly. Um, I think it's a case where people look and they see Man City defending champions currently in this side of the bracket with Arsenal. So Arsenal defeat... Um, Bayern Munich, Man City face Real Madrid. I'm I'm thinking people say whether Real Madrid go through or or um, Man City go through. I don't think they believe Arsenal will beat either of those. But that uh, here's the thing. I think Arsenal have enough right now to beat either Man City or Real Madrid. There is enough um, defensive the defensive capabilities. It's possibly the best defense in Europe. I need to check the numbers to confirm. But right now, best defense in the EPL. Probably it was the be- be- the best defense last season as well. 
aside from you know that late injury that caused the collapse. But best de best defense last season, best defense this season, best defense in Europe. I don't think either team have enough to beat Arsenal, but anything can happen. Um, I think I do think I feel if Arsenal go to the finals of the Champions League, I think it, it's them. So I mean, we should definitely be talking about a historic double for Arsenal, then Christoph, and their first Champions League title. Many persons don't realize that Arsenal has never won the Champions League in their illustrious history. The greats I, I, have I don't not think so. done it. I think I think I think I think everybody knows. I don't think there's a there, <laughs> there, there is always this argument every season that Arsenal have never won the Champions League. So I don't I don't it, think it, it, I don't it, think it's an unknown. Could this be the year that that curse is broken, though, Christoph? I mean, the greats have come and gone. The Henri, the Perez, the Cess. They came, they went, the Ozils, and they could not do it. The invincible team under Wenger did not win a Champions League trophy. It was very poor in Europe overall, but dominated domestically. Could this be the year that Arsenal finally break that drought and lift their first Champions League title, while potentially also lifting the EPL? Well, why is it, no one talking about this? This, this, if that were to happen, this would potentially go down as the greatest year in Arsenal history. Indeed, indeed. But I, as I said, I may be the first to be proposing such a feat. You know, I haven't heard anything from the mainstream media. No one is talking about this. But I'm seeing things ahead, and I'm looking at that as being a distinct possibility where Arsenal could do the historic double of winning the Champions League, the first in their history, and of course, regaining the EPL after a long drought. So I'm looking at it like that. And as I said, with the sort of momentum which this team has, you know, anything is really possible and more attention should be given to such a feat. But we'll wait, we'll see. We'll see until the mainstream media start writing this new narrative and the fans start jumping on that bandwagon. But, you know, we are here to beat the press to these sort of stories and these narratives, you know. But from a Man City point of view, Christoph, how do you see this Man City title challenge? Can they, in fact, defend their title, both in the EPL as well as in Europe? Do you um, see them getting the better of Real Madrid, for example, their next match? I, I think Man City is better than Real Madrid. I I don't believe Real Madrid this season is as good as people probably think. Last season they were better. They had um, you know, Madrid and Cruz, you know, were a little bit younger. They had Benzema. But this season, no. I don't I don't think they're better than Man City. Man City have Erling Haaland, Kevin De Bruyne fully fit. Um, the Bryan looked very good over the weekend. Phil Foden in top form. Um, there should be absolutely no way that this Real Madrid team should be beating Man City outside of some very questionable refereeing decisions or Pep Guardiola tinkering and, and giving it up. <laughs> no, I think Pep has had no enough experience in Europe and have faced this uh you know this real madrid team before i don't think there'll be any tinkering yeah. of that degree uh, so to speak i i do but i, I, don't I do see feel they any should way. get the better of real madrid as well that's my I feeling also I, yeah i i don't see any way that this real madrid team can beat man city outside of some questionable refereeing decisions well i i wouldn't go so far as to say they can't beat uh, Real Madrid of a two legged. No, Real, uh, Mad Real Madrid Real Madrid can't beat this Man City team over two legs. Well, I'm not gonna completely write off this Real Madrid team. They do have quality when you look at the likes of a Jude Bellingham, which has which potentially you could say is the best midfielder globally right now. Christoph, where would you rank a player like Jude Bellingham? Surely he would have been in your top five in terms of oh, midfielders in the world. Definitely, the definitely, he is you know top five um, midfielders and and not just midfielders, top five players in the world right now. But we've seen where you know a potential suspension or injury to Jude Billingham tends to cripple Madrid. 
especially against stronger opposition. We have so seen the, the, the where players like... depth may be missing from a, a, a Madrid when Madrid compared to season. a Man City. Exactly. We've seen where, you know, we've had players like Valverde and Vinicius bailing them out, but without Jude Billingham, they have looked weak. So maybe Pep will have a plan to, you know, isolate him out of the game, mark him out of the game potentially, and that will kill Madrid. Well, I mean, Rudiger, speaking of being marked out, Rudiger did have a fantastic uh, game last season versus Haaland. It is Rudiger that may have laid the blueprint for many teams in terms of how to shackle Haaland. And, you know, the Arsenal de defense seem to have watched back that tape of how Rudiger played against Haaland last season in the Champions League, where he was totally dominated by a Rudiger. You know, Rudiger was following him everywhere, closely man marketing him. I mean, if Haaland went to the bathroom, Rudiger was there the door waiting for him to come out so it, it could be a repeat <laughs> yes yes and no but look uh, here's the thing last season last season arsenal beat man city in the um the community shield as well so two seasons in a row man city were have been beaten in the community shield by arsenal that first game we saw erling haaland completely anonymous as well People were saying, you know, was he a flop? You know, went on to score, what, 42, 44 goals for the season. But if you looked at Erling Haaland against Arsenal last season, he struggled. Right? So he are you got... saying teams have figured out how to play against Haaland now? I mean, no, he's no, totally no. I think... has significantly dropped off since last season. Is it I... that teams have now figured him out? I, I'm not sure his teams have figured him out. I think Haaland's drop-off in goal tally is down to three factors. One, teams do see where he is, you know, he stays high. He doesn't drop into the midfield to support. I don't think that's Haaland's fault. I think Pep Guardiola tells him, stay high, wait for the ball. You know, he is easy to mark him when he does that, but he also occupies one to two defenders, which helps create space for the other players, which is why last season we saw Pep using are you know, starting to use that box midfield. He introduced that extra player to make up for the fact that the striker is not dropping deep to assist. And we saw where it went to you know, devastating effect last season. He was new to the league. He was an unknown quantity, very fast, very powerful. This season, teams are not afraid of him. Teams know what he's going to do, know what he's capable of. So, you know, we've seen Erling Haaland struggle against the big six teams he still scores against the smaller teams right but we've seen him struggling this season compared to last season no it could be a case where you know last season was just you know a freak season for him that 42 44 goals and we won't see that again kind of with you know mohammed salah first uh -oh. season at liverpool <laughs> First season no, at but Liverpool. Salah, if you check Salah numbers, he has remained consistent. Oh, no, 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 no. Another we're, thirty we're, plus goal season this season saying, again. I'm not saying Salah. Uh, is I'm not, not I think Salah is a bad comparison. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, no. You're you're missing what I'm saying. I'm not saying Salah, Salah is not good. I'm saying that season was way above what his normal level. Oh, but we're is. saying Salah has consistently been producing the goods at a he high has, level for. He, what, four, five, six years now at Liverpool yes, or ever he since has. his introduction at Liverpool, in all honesty? No season has he really faltered or dropped off with any sort of significance. No, I mean, no, the no. drop off from Haaland this season, even though he's still the league's top goal scorer, is quite significant. He's the top goal scorer, not by much. There are a number of players that could potentially catch him, including Phil Foden, Salah, Bakayo Saka, uh, only what kill? Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, there there are more players now in and around his number. You know, last season he was way ahead of the, the pack, you know, but he's still in the conversation. So his fall off isn't as significant or as detrimental as we would want to think. He is still one of the league's top marksmen. And, you know, even though his numbers may not necessarily be as comparable to that of last season, still a quality player could go off at any moment. He's like a time bomb waiting to explode with a hat trick or even four goals in any given match. So no, yeah, in every given match, we've seen where he could, you know, he he will go two or three games 
don't score, struggle to score, and then he goes off and gives us, you know, three or four goals. But this but, season, I mean, you had mentioned seen... earlier, Christoph, three factors. What were the other two? I mean, you mentioned one in terms of him staying high on the pitch. Oh, but him, what him were the other high. two factors? Him staying high. The second thing is that Pep Guardiola has instructed him on what, how he's supposed to play. When you look at Haaland, how he used to play at Dortmund, we saw Haaland drop deep, get into play, make passes, you know, running from deep. We don't see that anymore. It's down to his instructions. So that is going to pre- it, not prevent him from scoring goal, but he's not as dynamic as he was before. And as such, you know, it's a part of that predictability. Teams are going to predict, hey, he's going to do this. This is how we stop him. All right? Okay. And I have forgotten what my third point was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll try so pretty it, much you're saying oh, one is that Pep uses him high, you know, that out and out number nine, so to speak. Two probably is the familiarity. I mean, last season he was unknown to much of the league. So that familiarity, you know, teams are now familiar with his game, you know. They've now see defenders have seen him up close and personal. They know his strengths, you know, uh, video analysis highlight his weaknesses, you know, and of course other teams have shown us the blueprint in terms of how to deal with Haaland, you know, to me, the best example of that was Rudiger last season. I think every other team has now taken up that template and are now employing a very close man-marking system. It's almost as if teams are saying, hey, Haaland, you're not going to beat us. Let one of your other teammates uh, get the goals, you know, and so that to me is a factor as well. So him playing higher, not dropping deep. And of course, as you say, you know, the, the familiarity factor. And possibly the third one, as you say, it's how his game have changed under Pep, so to speak, which makes him not as, you know, dynamic and a bit more predictable. So, you know, so uh, we'll see. I mean, this is the second season in the league, not as much goals as last season. And as you say, last season could have just been one of those uh, out of the box season, so to speak. But time will tell for sure. And it will be interesting to see if he can, you know, win the golden boot this year and see how he 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 takes to the field next year. But of course, this year he has been out injured for a number of games as well. So that may be another factor to look at this season in terms of why his statistics have been lower than the last. Last season, I believe he went the entire season without missing a game, you know, he was fit if not for rest which Pep gave him, but this season he has definitely had a few injury problems a few injury concerns and, you know, Pep has been a bit more cautious using him a bit more sparingly and guarding against potential injury, but definitely two big games there coming up in the Champions League uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, you know, Arsenal is in action uh, Man City is in action, of course. Liverpool is in action versus Atalanta on Thursday in the Europe Europa League. And it will be interesting to see how Klopp approaches that game, to be honest, Christoph. In terms of the lineup, the lineup he puts out will tell me where his priorities lie. If he goes with a full 11 versus Atalanta, then that's telling us that, hey, we've given up on the EPL. You know, we, we'll take whatever come, but, but if he rotates and then save his best 11 for the weekend, that will be a clear indication that he still believes that this Liverpool team can push for the title. For me, I am not holding my breath on that. My my confidence has been dashed and dashed significantly by this result versus Manchester United. And I really not holding any hopes of us really lifting the title. You know, this was a prime game to win and we feel that hurdle to get over this Manchester United team, you know. A game we should have won. We came away with a draw. Not good enough at this point. And if you're going to become champions, you can't ask other teams to do your dirty work. So, for me, Liverpool out. The fight is now between Man City and Arsenal. But Christoph, any final words in terms of this weekend's action? I mean, we're quickly running out of time. Any final thoughts? Um, I think this this weekend's action will be. I mean, do you mean the weekend that just ended? That's right. Um, interesting weekend. 
results were as expected for me. Arsenal back at the top of the table and it's now for them to push on and continue and go uh, go on to win this Premier League and their first Premier League in 20 years. Um, it will be a monumental and historic feat for them. Um, and especially if they can even push on to win the Champions League. Uh, indeed, how time flies, how time flies. I mean, it has been 20 years since Arsenal have really lifted an EPL title. Invincible. Ah, it, it, <laughs> ah well, you know, viewers and subscribers, you really have to take in these moments in ah, such a big team, such a big name team, which such an illustrious history and the caliber of players which have graced the Emirates and previously, you know, Highbury. You know, many of our younger listeners and viewers would not even know that Arsenal once played their football at a stadium called Highbury before moving to this modern facility, you know, but how time flies, you know, how time flies. So, you know, once we're alive, we just have to take advantage of the opportunities and appreciate the sort of caliber players and caliber football we're actually seeing before our own eyes because time is the master, time is undefeated. And we're seeing what I would consider the last of the GOAT in action. You know, Lionel Messi is on his final hurrah. And if you haven't seen him live in person, then this may be the final opportunity for you to see him shine and flourish. But it's on that note, viewers and subscribers, that we bring the podcast to an end. You know, we're just asking you to continue to support us. The support has been tremendous over the period. Continue to share, continue to like and continue to send us your well wishes. Christoph, I'd just like to thank you again for coming on board and really sharing with us your thoughts and your opinions. But viewers and subscribers, until next time, this is Rafa signing off.